Why are these sums? If you learn what they're about, most people don't. Very complicated, elusive. You got to fill in a lot of the blanks. It seems that a lot of them are inspired by dangerous circumstances in which he found himself. His life was in danger. He was running. He was on the run. He was being pursued with mur literally murderous intentions. People wanted to kill him. And he complains about them. People he trusted betrayed him. People who he, he was good to them, they were they turned him in. And um, there were there were battles and times when things didn't look so good. And a, a person could feel that Hashem's protection had been removed. But in the end, the theme that comes returns, that he returns to over and over and over again, Rivka, is that no matter what happens, his trust in Hashem does not falter. And that's what's unique about all of these things. And that's why people read them for centuries thousands of years people read these and take inspiration because we all have our troubles and the theme of all these different songs is to trust in Hashem and to rely on Hashem and to see that everything that happens is only from Hashem and he's, he's running the whole show so they come with their chariots and their drones and their tanks and their supersonic missiles. And, and we come with the name of God on our lips. And of course we have very elaborate air defense systems that we also have to have. But in Mitzvah we don't have to use, we won't have to use them. Unfortunately, now we do have to use them. I saw a video, a very interesting video clip yesterday where the Rebbe was speaking to military people from Israel and he was scolding them but very gently, very nicely, but he was scolding them. He was, he was talking shop with them and, and telling them that they have to show their might and their strength, he said. If you have strength and you keep it in a box, it's not strength. If you have a product and you don't advertise it, you don't have a product. Person can say, well, I made the product, you know, I did my bit. But if you don't advertise it, you didn't do anything. Nobody knows about it, no one's gonna buy it. So similarly, showing strength, argued the Rebbe, Showing strength, you know, for instance, like um, in the Yom Kippur War. That this goes back before any of you girls were even born or thought of. So it was a terrible war. It was very, very hard, hard on the Jewish people, but they turned it around. They turned they turned defeat into victory. And they had an open road to Damascus. And remember, it was urging them that they should go into Syria and take control of Damascus. And the military people, I mean, the politicians in Israel said, no, the whole world is going to scream at us. And so the Rebbe said, Take it, you have urged to go and take control of that city, even if you only do it for a day. 
because that shows your strength. Then you can do it again. You shouldn't have to do it again. But don't stop short. They took the Golan Heights and then they stopped. He said, keep on that. Now there's nothing between you and Damascus. Go, take Damascus. Put the fear of God into these people that they shouldn't start up with you anymore. Because until then, from the heights of the Golan, they were just throwing bombs into, the, into all the places where the Jewish people were living at will. It was very difficult to, to, take, to take over the Golan Heights. And they never want, they never want them to make a complete and clear victory. And that would be a deterrent to further conflict. Time and again, we didn't, the, the politicians did not listen to the Rebbe's sound strategic advice. And the Rebbe said, if you're not going to listen, there's going to be sacrifices. So we're going to have to pay for it. And um, unfortunately, we've seen time and time again, even to the present day, the accuracy of the Rebbe's understanding and his predictions. Okay. By the way, I, somebody sent me a clip yesterday, fascinating, that uh, a Holocaust survivor came to America. He didn't have anything, uh, no money, no nothing. And didn't have a place to stay. He was introduced to a wealthy person. And he said to the wealthy person, listen, I will work hard, but I have no place to stay. I heard that you have buildings. Give me a place to stay. I'll work hard. I'll pay you back. He said, okay. And he had an acquaintance who was with them together in Auschwitz. And he said the same thing to the wealthy man. And he gave him a place to stay too. And they paid him back. And when it came Pesach, they had no money to make a Seder. So they came again to the wealthy man and they said, sorry to bother you, but we need to make a, 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 a Passover Seder. We have no money for matzahs and for wine and for food. He says, Go to the store and try. everything's on me. Whatever you need. And then came Yom Kippur. This, this is how, how, what I heard. Then the person was telling this story. Then came Yom Kippur, and, and they had not prayed on Yom Kippur for how many years? They were, they were in concentration camps. They said, so We have no place, so we have no money for to, to, to buy tickets to go to a synagogue. So they, according to this story, they, they contacted the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe contacted this person and told him, this, that this, had this discussion with him, he said, I will build them a place to worship, where they can worship. And he built a shul. Who was that wealthy man? <laughs> the father of the president-elect. Trump. President Trump's dad. His father. And for some reason, you know, it wasn't uh, generally known. the, the uh, heritage of kindness in the family. Well, now he has Jewish great-grandchildren. 
Okay. Now we have a quite we come up to a question. We yesterday in the last few days we have been speaking about the metaphor of the birth of a child, which comes from the highest level of the intellect of Hashem in the highest of worlds. The four worlds are, we spoke about them. We didn't finish this discussion of the four worlds in brief. The, the highest level of worlds of before creation takes place is the potential for creation to take place. Okay? There has to be the potential before there can be the actual. Everything has a potential, an actual, a body, and a soul. Okay? So this highest world is called Atsilus. And this is a world of where the root of the word is eight cell, which means near or approach, close. So above Atsilus is Hashem. And there, here we have the world that is connected with Hashem. This is the world of unity with God. It's not separate. Unity with Hashem. This is still not creation. This is just Hashem. Now we're going to come. There's a great divide here. A tremendous divide. It has a name. I'm just going to mention it now. We'll talk about it a lot later. It's called Simtsum. We can't translate the word Simtsum. The closest translation you get to is like contraction. It's a, it, it's a barrier. A spiritual barrier that separates God from creation. Only on the other side of the Simtsum can we have something that is not unified with God. That's a creation. By definition, the creation is not unified with God. Well, not apparently unified with God. So that's a very high, holy level of life because we have to hide. If this is God, where's the world going to go? So we have to hide some of this uh, just for the sake of a, uh, a metaphor. Let's say we're going to hide this a little bit, 25%. So, it's, so the whole thing is light and 25% is going to be dim, like when they dim the lights in the theater before they show you the show. So it's a little bit dim here. So because this, this it's not just the corner, it's like the whole thing is a little, is a little bit dim. Follow? Mm -hmm. So that's stage number one of creation. Now we're gonna keep on going. Stage number two is not yet, it's much more dim. So we're going to see here, it's 50% dim. Much deeper level of hiding. Now we can even begin to conceive of things. There are no things up here. It's angels and holy, holy Intelligences, godliness is revealed. It's very, very high. Here, we can already conceive of things, a world of things, a world of forms. Before you have a, 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 a table, you have the idea of the table. The second level is, is forms. That's called Yetzira. So Bria, creation, it's the beginning of the concept of creation. Here you have the concept of creation. Here you have the forms 
the creation could take. Okay, we're going to have a world, a real world. There's a Mexico, Canada, whole world. Okay, now we have another quantum divide, big, big leap. You know, big leaps. It says when the neshama moves from one level to the next, it has to totally forget where it was. Because if you if the neshama, the way it was in, in the world of formation, would be exposed to the world of creation, it would go insane. It wouldn't be able to handle it. It doesn't have it doesn't have the the capacity for the uh, the intensity uh, of the energy. So and similarly in learning Talmud. The, 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 the Talmud, the way it was taught in the land of Israel was a very high level. And the majority of the Jewish people were not living in Israel. It was a time of exile and the temple was destroyed. And the learning continued in Babylon. From this we get the Talmud of Babylon. So we have the Talmud of Jerusalem and the Talmud of Babylon. Two oral versions of explaining what Judaism is all about, running at the same time. But one is much higher than the other. If a person was such a great scholar in Babylon and he wanted to go to learn Torah the way it was being taught in Israel, so this idea is mentioned in my morning very often in Hasidus, he had to forget the whole way of thinking in the in, in Talmudic study in Babylon in order to be able to deal with the way the Torah was taught and learned in Jerusalem. Similar concept. When you go from one intellectual level to a higher level, you have to leave the lower one behind. You know, it's like in the early days of my youth, when rocket travel, space travel was just beginning, you know. So they used to have rockets with three stages. The first stage was a powerful thrust to get you out of the gravitational pull of the Earth. And after a certain point, it would let go. It would let go of the whole, the whole body of the rocket. And second stage rockets would begin to blast and take the rocket up further. So there's a point at which the, the, the rocket itself with the fuel and the weight was no longer a thrust, but it was a drag. So we had to, had to let it go. In the same way, the, the, the awareness of level number two would, would confuse any creature being intelligence on the higher level. Now we're gonna continue down, make another tremendous symptom division here. I'm going to come down to the lower level here where the hiddenness is not just 20%, not just 50%, where it's 75%. You're not going to see godliness at all. And a little bit of light, a little bit of light is going to shine in here. Very little bit of light, maybe 10%. 10% light and 90% hidden, thin, thin. Okay, this is not literally exactly the way it is. It's just metaphors to give you the idea that in order for a world to exist, the light of God has to be hidden. Because if it's not, if it's if it's not hidden, there's no room for you to make a choice. And to, to make a choice is the highest thing 
intellectual potential that you have is to choose the difference between right and wrong. Everything else, Hashem is going to take care of for you. If you're tall or you're short, if you're light or you're dark, if you're skinny or you're fat, we don't even want to, we don't want to use that word. Skinny or heavy. <laughs> if you're smart or you're simple, if you're mathematical or you're connect, uh, or not, if you're handy or you're clumsy, if you're uh, creative, if you're a leader or you're a follower, all these things are, are, are not in your hands. Hashem takes care of all that. If you speak this language, that language, wherever you're born, the only thing that you have control of is your freedom of choice, moral choice of good and bad. Everything else is in Hashem's hands. But in order for you to make that choice, that it should be your choice, you have to hide. Let's give you an example. The Rebbe worked tirelessly to, after the war, Judaism was at, a, after the Holocaust, was at a real low end. And the Rebbe worked tirelessly on every single front to bring up the level of observance on a national and an international level, and a community level. So how did it play out on the community level? He encouraged people to wear beards. People didn't wear beards. Religious people did not wear beards. People didn't want to be seen as Jews in a Holocaust. I know, I, I know a family. We used to have a baseball league. I work in a children's organization. We had a baseball league. And you know where the kids played? In a a park was called by the name of Trump. He owned the park. He let, let us play there. <clears throat> and the coach, we had a couple of very nice coaches over the years. One of them, his name was Ashkenazi. His wife was a convert. Why was she a convert? There's a story. Her father was a Holocaust survivor, but he married out, deliberately married a non-Jewish woman. He didn't want to have Jewish children and she wanted to become Jewish and she converted and he screamed at her. He was very angry and upset because he, she was rejecting his whole attitude of life. And what was his attitude? Don't you understand? They're going to kill you. That he was traumatized by what he went through in the Holocaust. Okay. So the Rebbe had to change that attitude. That's why people didn't wear beards and people didn't uh, behave overtly in, a, in an observant way. So how, how, what did the Rebbe do? So the Rebbe once told one of his Hasidim that he would like very much that so-and-so would grow a beard. So please encourage him to grow a beard. But don't tell him that I told you this. So he went and told his friend, you know, why don't you grow a beard? You know, a lot of people nowadays are starting to grow beards. We give the Rebbe a lot of pleasure if he saw that you would grow a beard. So a beard is very holy and encourages holy tendencies in a person that has one. He said, no, the Rebbe knows I don't have a beard. He never said anything to me. If he said something to me, I would certainly grow a beard. But he never says anything to me. We talk about all kind, a, lot of, a lot of different things. In the early days, you could speak to the Rebbe easily. Now it's very hard. Later years, it was very hard to get an appointment to be able to catch the Rebbe. 
So he went back and he said, the Rebbe, you know, he says he would grow a beard if he knew that you wanted him to do it. He says, so tell him that I want him to do it. Tell him I would tell him I, I want people to wear beards. But don't tell him that I told you to tell him. He said, well, why not? He says, because I want him to grow his beard. I don't want that I should grow his beard. And that's the idea that Hashem, had, just like the Rebbe has to keep it a, a secret from him that he wants him to grow a beard, but he should do it because he wants to do it, not because the Rebbe tells him to do it. So we should do mitzvahs because we want to do Hashem's mitzvahs. Not we're being forced. Yeah, I don't want to be religious. They, they ram these mitzvahs down your throat. That's the response of people who do not want to be observant. I don't want people telling me what to do. Okay, so this is the idea of hiding. So we have four worlds. World of Atsilus, Bria, Yitzira, and this world here, I didn't label it, is where we live. This is where we belong. This is the world where we can do things. This is the world of action. And this is where action in Hebrew is a see you, like a see you later. <laughs> when I was a kid, I went to camp, we used to sing a song. We round to get show in a push cart, Rivka. Better be ready about half past eight. Don't be late. It's a camp song. <laughs> All right. So we have these four worlds. As the now the point of this chapter is that as the Neshama comes from Hashem higher than Atzilus into Atzilus. And then it comes down stage by stage through the world of creation, through the world of formation, into the world of hiding where God is hidden, into the world of action where you can do mitzvahs and learn Torah. Not like an angel that doesn't want to do anything else except learn Torah. So it comes down stage by stage by stage by stage by stage, just like a child is born. And the brains of the child and the heart of the child and the kishkas of the child and the legs and the limbs of the child all come from the highest level of the father's inspiration. So similarly, the neshama coming down stage by stage by stage through the four worlds, which correspond to the four letters of the name of God. So we've got Yud, K, Okay. A fourfold vision. And the idea is that on every level, the inner, inner, inner light is still connected with its source. Always. Never thought of that. Okay, well, let's take this a little bit further. Every world has 10 aspects to it. We're going to learn about that in chapter three. So that means that every world has Four within four, because in Atsilus you're going to have four levels, yeah. in Bri you're going to have four levels, you're going to have Yudke, Vavke in each, each of these worlds. Each one is going to have a full complement of 10, so we get the number 40. 40 comes up a lot. And the number four comes with the tetragram, how do you say it? Tetragram? Yeah. Atom. <laughs> so uh, just think of the pace of Seder service. How many fours do you have in the space of Satan? Four questions, four sons, four exiles, four cups of wine. Everything is with a Seder. Okay, so now this is all background to confront the next idea, which is since 
everything is connected like this to godliness, how does a person who says, I don't believe in God, I'm not interested in doing mitzvahs, when I got on the boat to leave Europe, I threw my tefillin over into the ocean, I don't want to see tefillin, and so on. How does he get his life? That's the question that we have to answer. There's a couple of very beautiful stories along, along these lines of people like that. If someone had the merit to communicate with them, was able to get through to them, like when they came, came to the Kaisal. And after 70 years, you know, put on a pair of pillows and they broke down. Started crying. Everybody cheered. <laughs> okay. So we'll come back to this tomorrow and finally answer that question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, he's actually Poe? Can, like, um, a ten station. But he's coming here as I know. Wow, that's so cool. Petra? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I also love you. Yeah, she's also, it's a family thing. Are you for real? No. <laughs> it's a family I thing. I think Petra should go. <laughs> Don't make her uncomfy. That's my job. <laughs> This is me, it'll be, and that's it. Just saying that in front of you. That she would be fine in your guys' way. We definitely need to tell them to get a haircut. This is so funny. Oh my god, we have our red box. We always go so good. Actually, I don't know if it's good for you. Can I smell? Wait, but it's here. Um, it's really nice. It just smells all the way past it than the other one. It's just like a, uh, you know, like this kind. Oh, oh I know what it is. Oh, yeah. Give it right now. Give it. 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 Oh, so they want to make two different things. Yes. Okay.